It's Monday. Welcome to the latest chapter of the Curve Wars. Once again, Curve is under a governance attack, this time coming from a meme-flavored DeFi project called Mochi Inu. Q Panic as the emergency DAO was convened to block Mochi from receiving its due CRV governance tokens. But how is this possible? And is it even enforceable? Those questions answered, plus a tip of the hat to Bitcoin and the successful implementation of the biggest upgrade on the network since SegWit. Smart contracts and DeFi on Bitcoin? Yes, apparently it's coming after this message from our sponsors. DeFi users, you no longer need to pay expensive and unpredictable interest rates on your ETH loans. Liquity, a decentralized borrowing protocol, allows you to borrow against your ETH interest free. Loans are paid out in LUSD, a USD pegged stablecoin, and need to maintain a minimum collateral ratio as low as 110%. To learn more, head over to liquidity.org forward slash defined to get started and get the most out of your borrowing needs today. So this curve drama, to begin with, we must whiz all the way back to August 19th with the introduction of Mochi, the autonomously governed decentralized stable currency protocol fully backed by long tail and yield bearing asset markets. Mochi Protocol unlocks productivity in these long-tail, staked, wrapped, and yield-bearing collateral assets, allowing users to borrow USDM, Mochi's native, over-collateralized stablecoin. Now, what do they mean by long-tail? Well, according to the documentations, it's those outside the largest and most well-known assets, such as BTC, ETH, stablecoins, and some DeFi blue chips. In reality, what we see here are vaults for Uni, Sushi, USDC, and DAI, albeit alongside less well-known tokens such as Alluvium, Vespa token, and Doge Killer. Well, nothing particularly concerning or unexpected here, however, but now fast forward to November 11th, when Mochi announces the launch of its governance token, Mochi, and then things get saucy. On Twitter, Mochi announced the acquisition of just over a million CVX tokens, which will be used to permanently boost the USDM slash 3CRV pool and secure yield in the form of CRV and CVX tokens for their liquidity providers. This is effectively a governance attack, and at its heart is VCRV, the voting escrow curve, the locked version of CRV that grants holders the ability to vote on boosting CRV rewards to certain liquidity pools. As you can understand, controlling the vote there could be highly favorable. Now, throughout 2021, a number of protocols have also tried to accumulate CRV and lock it as VCRV to boost rewards in pools that will benefit them. But Convex also plays a part here as well. Users who lock Convex's CVX token gain the right to vote on how that protocol's tokens are used to boost the rate of rewards. So here's what happened. A member of the Mochi team swapped $46 million in USDM for DAI using the Mochi curve pool. Then they swapped the DAI for ETH and used a large portion of that ETH to purchase significant quantities of CVX, which were then locked up. Now, this should have given them an absolutely enormous block of voting power to direct CRV rewards to the Mochi pool. This should attract more liquidity because the rewards are so good. That would allow them to swap even more USDM for stable coins to buy more CVX. The process repeats, liquidity flywheel spins up, and bingo. And of course, the more USDM they have, the more they can swap, but of course they need the liquidity, which is why if the rewards are great, more people come in, which gives them more liquidity to keep selling the USDM. You can see where this is going, right? All of this was detailed in a post by Charlie from Curve, outlining a number of concerns. Firstly, Mochi minted a huge amount of tokens to themselves. Mochi has no minting cap or tokenomics. Mochi has a custom price oracle set by the Mochi team themselves, meaning the Mochi team could mint as many tokens as they wanted if there was enough liquidity to trade it for stables that aren't backed by air. And then 99.5% of the circulating supply is owned by, quote unquote, the team, meaning the protocol itself was most likely under collateralized. So just imagine there's all these USDM floating around that's supposed to be backed by something, by assets, but if the team controls the supply and the team can mint them willy-nilly, I said willy-nilly, then they can simply just use that to buy more CVX, get more voting power, and just become seriously powerful. So more serious concerns were flagged on Twitter by Board Genius, as well as allegations of misconduct by Mochi's founder, Azim Ahmed, while he was working on Armour Finance. All of these are allegations which AZ himself vehemently denies. So after all this, Charlie announced the convening of the Emergency DAO, 
as this constitutes a clear governance attack and the emergency DAO deemed the liquidity providers in that pool to be at risk, the emergency DAO agreed to kill the gauge so it stops receiving CRV emissions immediately. They killed the gauge. <laughs> and Mochi's bold plan was shut down, just like that. But should it have been? Are the actions of the DAO against the spirit of DeFi? It's a big question here because we see hacks quite often in DeFi. And this idea that code is law, that if the opportunity is there, the code is there, then it's fair game. And this emergency DAO with its ability to just shut something down, is that fair game? It's hard to know, isn't it? So Ahmed is now blaming a so-called DeFi cartel for the shutdown, but the Mochi protocol itself is still active, there's been no rug yet, and AZ is adamant there won't be one. But the Mochi narrative has now shifted towards highlighting the presence of this cartel. It's us against those big, powerful OGs, like, I guess, Andre Bantag and Charlie, I suppose that's who he's thinking of. People that have established power bases that they don't want challenged. Now, when Solana was spammed into surrender a few months back, many balked at the ability of the network to simply shut itself down and reset. And there have been a number of instances recently where the spirit of decentralization has been challenged. And this is no different. You can see both sides of the argument here, but as always, once a precedent is set, it cannot be unset. And we've heard Gary Gensler and the SEC talking about decentralization theater, how they won't stand for it. So let us know in the comments how you see this one. In other news, Bitcoin's taproot upgrade finally came online, block 706632. The upgrade brings Schnorr signatures to the network, promising improvements to privacy, security, and scalability. And it just gives us all the opportunity to say the word Schnorr. Uh, these Schnorr signatures take up less space in a block, which means you can put more of them in a block, and they can be used to mask a Lightning Network transaction so it looks like a regular one. Privacy to a degree. Schnorr signatures should open up the possibility of DeFi capable smart contracts on Bitcoin because they are linear. And that's one development that we'll be monitoring closely here. If you imagine all the WBTC that currently exists on Ethereum might be able to play in the future directly on Bitcoin itself. Will they just move back? I don't know, it's hard to know. Anyway, all in all, just another crazy week in DeFi. And well, here's to another one directly ahead of us. Have a good one. Peace.